Hello, everybody. You are listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. And we have a very special episode today because this is our second episode that's dedicated solely to an interview. How about that? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. Um, and this has been a long time coming for us. Mm -hmm. And so today we are going to interview our good friend, uh, Meg Dixon, who is a science communicator and a paleontologist who also studies birds, uh, just like I do. Um, so Meg, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, <laughs> well, what you do and who's your companion who we're hearing right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Timing has gone poorly here. Hi, um, That's I am Meg. Um, I am a paleontologist and science communicator, as you guys have said. I study the paleoecology of early paleogene birds, so that birds right after the end Cretaceous extinction, um, especially around the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. Um, and I also run the blog Dinosaur a Day on Tumblr, uh, and I have done other projects such as Jewish educational mm -hmm. uh, blogs. And um, at one point, I had a fairly popular educational paleontology TikTok before I quit that. Um, my companion is my emotional support bird, Ellie, the green sheet conure, who is calling to her flock mates who have just been woken up because we timed this well. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, Ellie, your, your opinion has been heard. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're very happy to have you on. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's exciting. So how this is going to go, I mean, if any of our viewers remember the, the first big interview episode that we did with uh, Miles Grepp and Trey the Explainer. Um, we're going to be asking Meg a, a couple of basic questions about her life and work um, in paleontology, uh, among Judaism, and the online world. Um, and we're going to be interspersing sort of these section blocks with some viewer questions that we've been fortunate to receive. Um, so we have our questions and viewer questions and um, it's going to be just a very um, interesting episode full of a lot of different discussions that I think our viewers are going to appreciate. So, uh, Meg, if you're ready, we can we can jump right in if you want. Yeah, I think that the great flock calling has passed, so we're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good. So let's go ahead and we'll jump to the next slide. And um, you mentioned a dinosaur a day, so. Um, this is a you know, very popular, uh, famous blog that was on the um, microblogging network Tumblr. Um, and still is. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Still and there. still is, of course. <laughs> um, in fact, if you want to visit it, of course, we have the screenshot of the title page here, so you can find it pretty easy. Um, so, Meg, tell us, um, what inspired you and your friends, because this was a collaborative effort, um, <laughs> to create a dinosaur a day. You know, tell us a bit about the process of creating the blog and its subsequent history. So I started a dinosaur a day basically by accident. Um, I was following the account when it was run by someone else, and they realized they couldn't keep up with, you know, blogging about dinosaurs every day. Hmm. So they didn't want to just let go of the URL. So they asked if anyone wanted it. And I've always wanted to write a dinosaur encyclopedia. Um, growing up, those were my favorite books to read. I just devoured every single book that tried to comprehensively talk about dinosaurs. I wanted to know every single one. And yes, I knew even at, as a kid that that included all birds. And I was a little overwhelmed by that, but I still <laughs> wanted to do it. And so when the person didn't want the blog anymore, I was like, well, that sounds like fun. I would love to have a reason to write about dinosaurs every day, so I'll take it. And so I got my copy of the Dinosauria, which I had recently bought, and I put it in front of me and I started writing articles. And at first it was just me uh, writing and I would take images from Wikipedia or the internet. Um, because I was a stupid college student, I didn't credit the images <laughs> until uh, our friend Sam called me out and I was very happy that they did that because then I started crediting the images. Um, 
But as I was writing, I, you know, realized that a lot of these images weren't quite what I wanted them to be, um, mostly because it was becoming clear that dinosaurs were probably more feathered than we thought. This was back in 2013, early 2014, so even before Calendodromius was discovered. And I just, I like, it, it's kind of like you can see the writing on the wall situation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, thank you for pa uh, pitching in, Ellie. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I wanted to have more progressive, I guess, illustrations of dinosaurs, because we have so many illustrations of them as totally scaly. And that is one hypothesis. And for many dinosaurs, it's probably true. For some, we know it's true. But for many, we don't know. And they could just as easily have had feathers. And so I wanted to make sure images existed of both hypotheses, because until we know for sure, that's what they are. And so I roped my friends into helping. I'm not entirely sure how I managed to do that, given <laughs> how little money we made from Patreon and how little I was able to pay them. I basically have never made any money from ADAD. All of it's gone to the artists because I felt guilty about <laughs> taking their labor, even though they offered it freely. Um, so that was basically how it started and how it became collaborative. Um, after a while, I realized I wanted the quality of the articles to be better, so we started putting more effort into them. And this was a mistake because it turns out you can only handle so much work. Um, but now I just kind of use the blog to do edutainment and uh, com science communication on a less formal way with people and to talk about paleontology in my free time. Um, and this is after a few year hiatus because back when everyone was kind of leaving Tumblr, I also did. And it's good that I did because it allowed me to finally decide what I wanted to do with my life, but I also missed it, and so I'm back. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Uh, I, too, remember the great Tumblr migration. Um, oh, gosh. Now, for this encyclopedia, like, were you all able to write for every dinosaur, including birds? Yeah, I, I got through every non-avian dinosaur that had been described by the time I was done there. And that, when I say non-avian dinosaur, I usually mean everything outside of Neonithes, for clarification. Um, because Avale, I feel, is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, I got through everything outside of Neonithes. And I actually started Neonithes before we um, rebooted, as it were. And so I got through mo some chickens, and then I realized that going by clade was monotonous and boring, and I should <laughs> not have been doing that. <laughs> Why I didn't make this realization during Titanosaurs, I can't tell you, but it was <laughs> chickens that finally broke that back. <laughs> oh, look at all those chickens. For real, though. There's too many of them. <laughs> Were there any particular animals that you all were writing about that maybe you hadn't known a lot about before and they were kind of like a new discovery for you as you were working on this? I mean, I'm still proud that I managed to get the Calendodromius article out like two days after it had been discovered. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, because Kalinda was discovered so early on in ADAD's tenure, it just kind of became the ADAD dinosaur. Right. Because Again, my central thesis had been we should probably have in illustrations of dinosaurs with feathers because they might have had them. And then here comes the Kalinda, <laughs> kind of not fully proving my point. Obviously, there's still murkiness and science never has anything proven ever. But like, you know, it, a lot of points went into the Meg was right column. And so <laughs> it just kind of became a symbol for the blog and I used that opportunity to write an article about it quickly and then that kind of led to people thinking of me as the expert on Calendodromius which is <laughs> silly because I did not write the paper but <laughs> people started actually asking me questions about Kalinda like I once got an email from a news person what and, <laughs> wow and I, I don't remember this was back in college I and it was on my Notre Dame email so I wouldn't be able to tell you right but I was just like, you should email Godofroy, not me. 
<laughs> Apparently, God of Court doesn't answer his email very well. <laughs> That's amazing, though. <laughs> yeah, it seems like the Kalinda Dromius has kind of become like your mascot, your avatar now. Yeah, it's funny when I tell people it's not my favorite dinosaur. Mm-hmm. Because it's not. <laughs> it's second. Well, it dethroned Utah Raptor, which had been in second place for most of my life, but it's not first. <laughs> well, what is first? Uh, Myathora. That has been my favorite since I was a wee bairn, if you'll humor me there. <laughs> I, I think it was just the whole dinosaurs aren't monsters. They were complicated, nuanced animals like ones today, and they took care of their young, which in retrospect should have been the uh, null hypothesis, and I'm irritated it wasn't. <laughs> that was also cool that um, Myasaur had a, like a, kind of like a, a feminine genus name for a change compared oh, to yeah. what we're used to. Yeah, whenever someone says Myasaurus, I kind of twitch. <laughs> 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 Well, speaking of um, Kulindas, I do know that you have kind of also uh, put forward uh, Kulinde, which is, <laughs> uh, I believe it's the anniversary of the publication of that paper, the description of the animal. Yeah. Um, um, do you want me to talk more about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so it, essentially I wanted to make the people who followed ADAD into more of a community because I enjoyed interacting with my followers and I think that community building is important um, mostly because most people don't really have them anymore mm. because our society has fragmented itself to hell and back right. um, mm. and so I knew that fake holidays were really and truly a way to do that mm. uh, it gives people something to look forward to and something they feel like they're a part of and so I just decided that on the 24th, I would always reblog all the Kalindas I could find on Tumblr. <laughs> and so then that encouraged people to draw Kalindas. And eventually, you know, we wanted to do stuff that people could participate in, even if they couldn't draw. So we started doing live streams of us playing games, and it just went from there, basically. And so then some classic jokes came out of early Kalinda streams, but we still do it today. And it was one of the few things that kept going from ADAD even when I was uh, taking a break from Tumblr. Hmm. So, yeah, people like holidays. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly were fun experiences. I, I, I've tried to participate in as many cool and day streams as I could. Um, yeah. I think I made it through the entirety of the most recent one, actually. You did. It was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Cause I, I always like those opportunities. I, I agree with you to, you know, kind of get together as a community and, and kind of share in a mutual love of, of the subject material, in this case, paleo. Right. And, and how amazing dinosaurs and other animals are. Um, well, other organisms are, certainly. Right. And now, um, you are, of course, behind many other online ventures. Um, one in particular that I know has been well, certainly of interest to me was Clado Circles. Um, <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about that? That's a deep yeah. cut. <laughs> deep cut. It's funny. That came up yesterday. Um, <laughs> any, uh, yeah, so at one point, there was an informational post going around on Tumblr. Yes, Ellie, you weren't alive then. Um, <laughs> that what had basically the different relationships of vertebrates drawn not as a tree, but as basically kind of a venn diagram with different circles inside of each other mm. obviously unlike a real venn diagram none of them overlapped but it demonstrated the concept of like birds being a kind of reptile and all amniotes being a kind of fish that kind of thing mm -hmm. and i thought that it was just easier to follow along with visually than a tree for most people mm -hmm. um and i i really need the world to stop thinking of life as a hierarchy for a million reasons and that's kind of part of it mm -hmm. so i wanted to make these images that would help people understand more the kind of equality and diversity of life 
And so, and it was also a visual thing that I could do, unlike drawing, which I can't. So uh, I started making some and people really liked them. And I made a bunch of them um, for a bunch of different clays. And you actually helped me a little bit and made some yourself, Joan. Um, That's right. I think I did some fish. You, you did sharks, and I think you did mammals, too, because I'm not a mammal person. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah. Um, and eventually I had to stop because it was a lot of effort. I think I was trying. And, like, once you get to a point, there's only so much you can include. So I think I was trying to do tetrapodomorpha, and it kept crashing, and so <laughs> I gave up. <laughs> so that is how that project kind of stopped but the the ones that i did make are still up and they're mostly not completely out of date at this point it's still funny to me how fast paleontology moves given everything we study is dead but mm -hmm. you know there you go <laughs> yeah and um i definitely agree with you on the the visualization aspect of, of conveying a phylogeny much more I guess accessible to, to right. non-specialists. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm seeing a little bit more of this, at least in my daily life. I know the last time I visited, well, the last time, the first time that I visited the the newly updated fossil hall at um, the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of Natural History, um, they had a couple like uh, um, posters and signs where they were visualizing certain groups of organisms. Uh, I think in one case it was like arthropods and, and other um, related invertebrates. And they weren't using trees. They were using this sort of circle in circle in circle mm -hmm. approach to show that, to show that like insects are a type of crustacean, for example. And uh, I mean, it immediately brought me back to the cladus circles. I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is cladus circles like in, in a museum. Like this is, right. this is great. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen them in papers, too. I don't remember which ones, but I've definitely seen people showing uh, the relationships of stuff with circles in, like, literature. So that's fascinating. <laughs> um, I, I think it just helps to simplify and easily show certain fundamental things, like you can't leave a group you evolved from. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, things are, a, you know, a part of something else, that kind of stuff. And I, you know, I love phylogenetic trees, the classical version. I think they should be easier to understand than they are because they're essentially just family trees zoomed out. Mm -hmm. But it helps to have as many different for ways to show data as possible because not every way is going to work for every person. Absolutely. So, so right. much like this life, diversity is key with SciComm as well. <laughs> yep. Oh, definitely. Um... And speaking of which, I do recall that uh, you participated in the creation of a study using diversity um, based on social media platforms as a way to educate mm -hmm. on paleontology. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So this was before COVID, which I find very funny because suddenly everyone wanted to know if the internet could teach people. <laughs> um, but, you know, most people in the world are not actually able to learn in the way public education functions, um, especially in the United States, uh, mostly because it's geared towards, you know, the, the ideal type, so not disabled or neurodivergent mm -hmm. in any way, um, and able to function in a classroom and able to have resources in the classroom and everything else. And so part of the reason I'm so passionate about being a science communicator is because even though I had many obstacles that should have made it harder for me to learn, I was very good at school, mostly because I just love learning. And so my ADHD was manageable when I was learning. Um, and so I recognize that that was a privilege. And so I really want to take the education that I have been lucky enough to be able to have and give it back to people because I think knowledge is something that everyone deserves to have. And so um, I recognize that the traditional classroom doesn't work for everyone. Um, you know, 
whether or not it's accessible to you physically or you can't pay attention or it's too mentally overstimulating or you just can't afford it. Um, there are lots of reasons why people might not be able to, you know, go take a class at the college level. So I wanted to create a science class about dinosaurs. So a subject that lots of people like, um, also one that I can confidently talk about. <laughs> and I uh, wanted to make a class online using social media and accessible free platforms like Google so that people could learn and I could give some of that knowledge back to other people. So at first we did just a study about whether or not people felt like they could learn via social media. Um, so that was kind of the preliminary study. And it, and it was self-reporting and everything, but most people indicated that they did learn from social media. And what's fascinating is that it, as long as it's not you know misinformation or fake news, uh, social media allows for connectivist learning mm -hmm. um, where you take one topic and then it connects to another and then it connects to another and your brain follows that chain. And that actually helps your brain synthesize the information more than treating them as isolated topics. Um, but I wanted to see if a formal educational environment would also work in this way. So we used Discord and the Google suite of products and we let people join for free because I'm never gonna make any money ever because I'm too much of a communist. And so I couldn't, I couldn't justify charging for the class. And so I taught about the evolution of dinosaurs through birds um, and I had a lot of help, including from Alb and our other friend, Henry. And uh, it was just entertaining because we could measure the progress of the students and see how much they learned based on testing. And also just got to see all these wonderful projects they made mm -hmm. about different groups of dinosaurs and how they evolved. And so it was an extremely rewarding uh, experience. Um, it let me experience, you know, teaching a class on my own with no supervisor because I've only been a TA this whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and it also just let me show that you can use the internet to teach effectively, which a lot of people came to me during COVID and asked how I did that because suddenly everyone had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. That was um, History of Dinosaurs, correct? Yeah. So basically just how they evolved from the Triassic till today, essentially. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, I imagine that would be a class that a lot of people would really enjoy taking. Oh yeah, I, people have asked if I would do it again. And the <laughs> answer is, if I had time, absolutely, right. I would do it again. <laughs> that's the rub. <laughs> I, yeah, I actually, I have a lot of um, friends from not the science world who I've technically promised to do a history of life class oh. for. That <laughs> one is, still on pause until I have time for it. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, that is, that is, that's always the cake, isn't it? It's like, right. you have all these amazing, great ideas that would totally work, but it's just the time and, and the, the energy mm -hmm. needed for them. Um, I, I have what I call brain crack disease. So uh, brain crack is a term developed by Hank Green. Um, it's essentially just ideas that your brain comes up with. And if you're not familiar with Hank Green, he is, uh, our listeners, I guess, um, he is one of the Green brothers and he has so many projects, it feels impossible. Um, <laughs> this guy helped invent Crash Course, he invented SciShow, he has an uh, environmentalist website, he invented 2D glasses, <laughs> uh, he has the Awesome Socks Club, he has a podcast, he wrote books, the list goes on. And so obviously he has a problem where he keeps coming up with ideas. And so he calls them brain crack because you can get addicted to coming up with ideas. Mm. And I feel this because I definitely <laughs> have that problem. Uh, my, my reaction to most things is to come up with a, my own idea or version of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just am always coming up with ideas for projects and things that I never have time. And I often don't even have the proper skills to do them so it's it's something that i constantly have to deal with <laughs> mm, i totally empathize empathize for sure um, now regarding um history of dinosaurs are there any um 
Are there any interesting anecdotes you have from that course uh, regarding interactions with students or uh, interesting situations that occurred? Well, it was a while ago now, so my memories are not exactly clear of a lot of them, but I do oh, know course. that there was a lot of entertainment around uh, earliest birds in the um, Cenozoic, just because not a lot of people follow the evolution of dinosaurs after the end Cretaceous extinction, um, which is understandable. For most people don't know there was more evolution of dinosaurs <laughs> after the end Cretaceous extinction. Um, so just kind of going into how quickly modern birds diversified and how soon we see modern clades, penguins just practically show up out of thin air, for example. <laughs> and so uh, it was just fascinating to see how excited people could get about bird evolution because there's kind of this unspoken thing that, you know, once dinosaurs became birds, no one cares about them anymore. And I just don't think that's true. Uh, not just because people like birds, but because even people who wouldn't necessarily like birds, it's interesting to see how dinosaurs kept evolving and arguably are doing better than ever mm -hmm. now that they've decided to focus on the tiny flying thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it was just great to see all the excitement and enthusiasm over paleogene birds specifically um, during the class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add, because as you mentioned earlier, um, I, I was involved in this project to, <laughs> to an extent. Um, it, 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 was, it was one of those things that uh, it, it was kind of really thrilling to, to be able to pull it off, just, just like this right. free online class, just yes. <laughs> open to the public and covering the entire history of dinosaurs. It, it, was, it was a lot of work, but it, it, was, really, <laughs> it was really fun and rewarding to, to work on. Um, and in our presentation here, um, on the slide where, where, that I'm on now, um, I, I put up the, uh, a copy of the poster that we actually presented mm -hmm. uh, about our experience teaching this course. Um, and we presented it at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Annual Conference, which is one of the biggest conferences in our field. So yeah. uh, it, it, it was pretty cool that, you know, this... Uh, sort of pet project that we had was able to culminate in the these kinds of insights and this sense of achievement <laughs> yeah like i i would love to keep going with it and to keep doing studies about how effective free online education can be mm -hmm. uh it's just we're all busy now the yep. people who were involved with this either have a full-time job austin has a kid on the way or or are you know in paleontology grad school and trying to focus that would be me and henry right. um, to varying degrees of success <laughs> gosh I mean, it's it's remarkable for sure and um that's actually a very good segue um so let's jump ahead a slide to um some of our first viewer questions very um, serious ones yes very yeah serious. absolutely so uh, this is from our, our, our good friends, Sky and Emily. Meg, why are birds <laughs> I mean, the serious answer is very large predators became very small flying animals of a variety of ecologies, and so they have a lot of anger in a very <laughs> tiny package. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the more we learn about epigenetics, the more I'm questioning how much we actually can, like, how much there's stuff that's passed down, you know, over the generations. Uh, one of my biggest questions is, do we have epigenetic inherited trauma from the end Cretaceous extinction? <laughs> is that a thing we could still possibly have? Because that's interesting, if true. Um, it's just... It makes sense when you actually think about it for a little while that birds are the only dinosaurs we still have because they have a lot of adaptations that are directly helpful for surviving catastrophic events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the small size is obviously one of them, but not all of them are small. Mostly the uh, large brain size uh, compared to body size, the high neuronal density, mm -hmm. and you know, the ability to survive in a wide variety of climates. Like, we talk about how non-avian dinosaurs were found all over the world, but that's not entirely impressive when you remember that the world that they lived in was warm everywhere. <laughs> uh, 
but they still do live all over the world, and that includes frigid ice caps. Right. <laughs> so it it why are birds because they have the right adaptations is the correct answer. <laughs> if we're asking why are birds so silly, I I got nothing. Um, <laughs> It's a talent. <laughs> like I, I do have five pet birds. Um, I would have gotten pigeons, but the city of Chicago, where I lived when I was uh, getting my first birds, doesn't allow pet pigeons. It's illegal there. I, I find this to be very, very ridiculous. Um, if they would let people have pet pigeons, they could just pick them up off the street, and suddenly the city's pigeon problem is done. But. <laughs> Uh, so we got parrots. Um, we started with two cockatiels, and then eventually we got three rescue cunners. Um, and just everything they do makes sense, and everything they do is ridiculous <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I guess when when you're really small, really active, really smart, and you can go pretty much anywhere you want, I, I think that's just the logical outcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like earlier when we were trying to start, um, the other birds were being woken up. They are they they we separate them into the four and then Ellie because Ellie doesn't have a partner mm. and Ellie thinks she's a person. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so uh but you know, she obviously isn't a person, and so the four were all calling to each other like they do when they go downstairs, and even though she wasn't going downstairs, she felt the need to chime in. So makes complete sense is also ridiculous. <laughs> it really makes you think about how, in terms of wildlife, birds are probably some of the most accessible animals for people yeah. because like they're small and able to go anywhere they like. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like birds and insects. Like you go out inside in nature, you're guaranteed to see at least some of those. Mm. It's so, true. Like, even like, right now, I'm looking out my window, there's a huge flock of starlings that is just having a field day in the lawn. I love how starlings have essentially replaced passenger pigeons. Hmm. Oh, and by yeah. love, I mean I don't like it, but it's still kind of funny. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, starlings are an enigma to me, because, like, clearly, like, they're, they're an invasive species. Um, right. And, like, they've pushed out a lot of native birds. Um, but, I mean, like, I, I think that they're particularly gorgeous animals to look at. Oh, yeah. I mean, just the, the, the iridescent feathers and, and kind of their flocking abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, this seems like a great time to share my starling story. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Um, sure. So because I have a bunch of birds, um, I had a unique situation when I was last living in Chicago. Um, so I woke up, and this was before I got laser eye surgery, so I didn't have glasses and I could not see. Um, <laughs> and so I was getting up to go get something from the kitchen and I saw the silhouette of a bird on a chair in the living room. And so because at, at this time we had three birds, so I figured it was one of our birds. Didn't look quite right from a distance. The silhouette <laughs> didn't look quite right, but what the hell else could it have been? So I, you know, approached carefully with my eyes squinting to try to see what this was and by the time i got close enough to see i could see it was a freaking starling in our apartment <laughs> and we didn't have holes in the walls this was a nice apartment i it was in boys town i didn't understand how this could happen so i went i will i went back to my bedroom and i turned to my spouse max and i was just like max there's a bird in the apartment and he's just like, yeah, there's three of them. I'm like, no, Max, <laughs> there's a bird in the apartment. He's like, what? <laughs> like a wild bird? I'm like, yes, a wild bird. Because at the time, I, I couldn't really tell what it was. So I didn't want to confidently say starling. Right. I thought it might have been a grackle. Um, I wasn't close enough to tell. And so he went back out and he was just like, I don't know what to do about this. And so we ended up opening the window and it flew out um and we told our landlord about this and he was just like well i don't know how that happened so good for you for getting it back out um but was the, the most entertaining thing was that this happened a second time oh. <laughs> uh about half a year later uh we got back from a jewish celebration 
Um, and there was another starling in the apartment. Wow. <laughs> and we, we didn't know if it was the same one or anything, but we used the same method to get it out. <laughs> Uh, um, and with the, our, our working hypothesis for how they were getting in is that the super uh, in our building managed to find a hole in the bottom of our kitchen sink that like led to the roof. So we think they were flying down and coming out in here. Huh. Why our apartment? I don't know. Um, I it, it feels like a really weird coincidence. <laughs> The, after the second time, I, I, you know, jokingly threatened my spouse. I'm like, if it happens a third time, we're keeping it. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it never happened a third time. And then we moved. <laughs> so, but we actually, we have these chibi stickers of like birds um, from birdism. I don't know if you're familiar with that, like oh, social yeah. personality. But when we bought them, we bought the cockatiel forms that our cockatiels are a green cheek for ellie and then we got a starling sticker <laughs> <laughs> in honor of the starling that right. wanted to join the house <laughs> it kind of feels like one of those barnyard secret life of pet situations where yeah. like maybe your birds like were chatting up with the starling and they just let it in <laughs> I, mean, I, I can't prove they didn't because i was asleep <laughs> or away during both entry times <laughs> I also what can't prove they did. <laughs> it's like, what, what do birds do when we're not looking? <laughs> well, that, that's the fun part about having pet birds. Thank you, Ellie. And it's the fun part about having pet birds is that they're constantly surprising me with how smart and how much they understand. Um, like, there are times when Max and I are ch- talking and Ellie chimes in in ways that make too much sense (laughs) um like one of the words she knows is yes and she'll say yes only when it's appropriate and not when the answer is no and it's starting to scare us a little bit that's amazing yeah (laughs) like i think there's there's a book that i've read a, a while ago um called are we smart enough to know how smart the animals are and the conclusion was no, and I think that conclusion has held up over the years because <laughs> animals keep surprising us with how much they understand and how much they are able to figure out and comprehend. So, yeah. <laughs> That's a Friends to Wall book, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so I remember reading one that he wrote, which I guess is kind of the sequel, Mama's Last Hug, um, which is about animals. I that out. Yeah, I highly recommend it um, if you're interested in like empathy in animals and mm-hmm. especially like tor- like closer to like human origins as well, right. like what we can learn from uh, our primate relatives. Right. Um, yeah, very fascinating. I think we talked about it on the show once before. Um, it sounds on brand for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I am the hominin girl after all. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is a good a good. Uh, a good transition point. We move to the next slide. Um, Meg, one of the most um, remarkable and fascinating things to me about my experience with you as, as, as our good friend is learning more about Judaism and, and, and kind of helping to fill information blocks that I did not have growing up. Um, obviously, I, I we were kind of raised Catholic, but not really. Like, it was just kind of like that happened to have been the, the, the faith that my my parents followed. And, you know, they, they put us through, like, kind of the basic stuff, but they were never really fundamentalist about it um, mm-hmm. in any extreme ways. Um, and, of course, as I aged and I started, like, exploring more of the world and learning more about it, I realized that I had had very little knowledge on Judaism itself because... You know, the the frame of reference that we got growing up was from Catholic Bibles, basically, um, mm-hmm. which have, have taken the, the Jewish stories and kind of put them in their light. Um, <laughs> oh. And so I kind of wanted to touch base about this with you. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your experiences in Judaism? So I, I, I'll i be completely, you know, open and honest here. Um, I converted to Judaism, actually. 
Um, so I was raised Catholic too. Uh, I joke that my mom is more Catholic than the Pope because it's true. Um, and uh, I was that annoying kid in Sunday school who questioned literally everything. And that included Jesus. Um, I remember very distinctly uh, one morning when I was, I don't know, 10, maybe something around there. I was just like, if Jesus is supposed to be the Messiah, why isn't the world saved? And the Hebrew, not Hebrew, <laughs> the Sunday school teacher kind of went on a ramble about the second coming. And I was just like, but according to the first half of this book, because I actually read the Bible. Most Christians don't do that. I did. Because <laughs> um, I'm a huge freaking nerd. <laughs> and... Uh, I was just like, but it says here, here, and here that when the Messiah comes, the world will be perfect and better and everyone will be happy and nothing about a second coming. And the teacher told me to shut up. So, <laughs> I, um, uh, so I was raised Catholic. I went to Sunday school. Um, and then my parents realized that between me being a scientist and it being the 21st century, the odds of me staying catholic were very very low um i was already showing almost no interest in it by eighth grade so they sent me to catholic school which is the world's worst way to keep someone catholic <laughs> <laughs> so i went to a catholic high school for four years um which wasn't actually that bad uh like you'd think that the, a catholic high school would be the world's worst thing but catholics are different from other Christians. They do recognize that the Bible is supposed to be read allegorically and not literally. So I was never, you know, taught creationism was true. I never really had to deal with anti-science stuff. My science classes were very comprehensive. I mean, the other reason my parents sent me to this Catholic school is because it was the best school in my general area, and that included science. So, um, it, it really wasn't a big problem, though I did constantly hate all the Catholic stuff I had to participate in. Mm. Like, there was mm. mandatory mass for everyone, and it's not like everyone was Catholic. So that was great. Um, and then when it was clear that that wasn't working in terms of keeping me Catholic, they decided to force me to go to a Catholic university. Yeah. And so that how I went to Notre Dame, even though Notre Dame didn't have a living paleontologist on staff at the time that I joined. Um, and so Notre Dame was the worst. Um, I don't want to go too much into it because if someone listens to this and likes Notre Dame, they're probably going to get mad at me. Um, but so Notre Dame, because it was a university, it had people from all over um, attending. And so there were more creationists there, and there was more just kind of overbearing religiosity. Um, and I will never forget the time when I indicated to a quote unquote friend that no, I wouldn't date a creationist. And they managed to convince me I was being unreasonable oh. <laughs> by saying that. Yeah, I'm just like, now in retrospect, I'm like, of course I wouldn't. They don't believe my job. I don't. <laughs> it, it was a weird place. And like, unlike that, uh, my high school, which was, you know, mixed and everything, you know, the dorms were separated based on biological sex, which was an interesting thing to live with when I was starting to realize I was trans. Um, <laughs> and it, there were all these rules about when you could be where because they really didn't want the students having sex even mm -hmm. though they definitely were. <laughs> um, well, they're Catholic. You can't really be surprised by this. And so it was just very stifling, and I didn't get the education I needed or wanted. Mm -hmm. And the only good thing I got out of that experience was my future spouse and one of my closest friends. <laughs> and everything else was something I could have gotten somewhere else. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I went to two Catholic schools, and by the time I was done, I could not have been less Catholic. I just <laughs> saw how bullshit everything was. I saw how hypocritical it was. Um, and I had been drawn to Judaism most of my life. Um, 
because I had had Jewish friends since I was a little kid. And I remember various moments um, before I started going to Catholic school, uh, celebrating Hanukkah with a friend, going to my friend's bat mitzvah, uh, going to synagogue services and everything. And I'd always had more of a spiritual connection and feeling in Jewish things than I'd ever had in Catholic things. Mm -hmm. And so I started kind of researching Judaism, but not really because I knew that the aforementioned more Catholic than the Pope mom would not be thrilled about me becoming Jewish. Um, and But then I made a friend at SVP, actually, um, who was very Jewish. And so I started following her on Tumblr. And the more I read from her about the way Jewish people tend to think about and treat the world, the more I realized that this is where I belonged. And so... I found a great synagogue in Chicago um, that was extremely queer friendly, and I kind of openly wept when they referred to me with my pro with my preferred pronouns, hmm. um, and were you know non-binary accepting and everything. And uh, I enjoyed my conversion process with them um, because it was all about questioning things. I often say that Judaism is the most scientific of the uh, religions, because the religion itself is just people constantly questioning and mm. testing things. Um, the Talmud is essentially the world's longest scientific paper, because it's <laughs> just people arguing back and forth about whether or not this or that halakha works. Mm. <laughs> and so I finished that conversion fairly quickly, and this was also when... Uh, J.K. Rowling was starting to be obviously the worst person ever. Right. And and my two big hyperfixations prior to this point had been prehistoric life slash birds, so dinosaurs and all, and Harry Potter. And I needed something to replace Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> and so at that same time, I was becoming Jewish, and suddenly learning everything about Judaism became my other hyperfixation. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing educational stuff online because lots of people look into conversion to Judaism, especially online, and there needs to be good sources on that. And so I wrote how-to articles about how to do, celebrate different holidays and do different things, and people appreciated them. Hmm. So that's how I kind of got into Jewish education on top of uh, science education, which is very funny. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. I think that's really great. Um, and you certainly helped me out a lot with my um, understanding. And uh, I'm definitely, I definitely feel more Jewish adjacent in my, in my later years than I did before. So I do thank you for that. You're welcome. It's funny that I've dragged everyone down with me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know of particular relevance here. You have personally discussed many connections between Judaism and paleontology. Um, in fact, I, I do recall, um, like serious, semi-serious, you had mentioned that all dinosaurs are Jews, basically. Yeah, I, I have a thesis that that one's mostly a joke, but like, so Judaism, rather than things like Christianity or even Islam, uh, sanctifies time rather than space. Um, this is because we keep getting kicked out of places. Mm, right. Kind of hard to sanctify spaces if we have to move. So... <laughs> Um, uh, because we sanctify time, time is just a very big part of Jewish life. Um, I, one of the biggest things I love about being Jewish is just how much of my life is structured around Jewish time and how much order that adds to my life, which is helpful when I'm a chaos gremlin. <laughs> um, and so, uh, because time is a sacred thing in Judaism, a lot of Jewish people are drawn to paleontology. Hmm. And I think it's because ultimately studying the past, studying deep time is kind of a way of sanctifying it, um, making it holy because we're making it important to us. Because in Judaism, holiness isn't really like ultimate good or, you know, the peak of something or however it's thought of in Christianity, it's more something you set apart, mm -hmm. something important that you uh, honor. And I 
think for mo- a lot of Jewish people, including myself, studying all of the things that came before us is the best way to honor them. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and it's funny because like Judaism in itself never really had anything against the idea of the earth being that old um, because we don't read our books literally. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this thing called partes. Uh, it's a reading method where you first read the plain meaning of the text, the literal meaning, but then you go into like three different levels of deeper meaning, and those are the more important ones. Mm-hmm. And so in uh, the Talmud, as well as in our mystic texts, which are called Kabbalah, there's a lot of stuff about how before Adam is created in the creation story, everything is just kind of a metaphor and we don't know what a day is. It could be a year. It could be a hundred years. It could be a million. One person even suggested billions. Hmm. And so the timing of the six days or whatever is just kind of to help humans understand how the world was made. And so what an interesting thing is um, in Kabbalah, there's this idea of the four worlds which is that God created the world four times and each time something was wrong and he had to destroy it leading to another one. And so the response of rabbis to the discovery of evolution and prehistoric life essentially wasn't to say it was wrong, but was to find Jewish texts that supported it. Mm. And so they immediately aligned up these four worlds with the Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Right. And I just, I just find that extremely fascinating and kind of a weird coincidence at the end of the day. <laughs> um, and like, even though there are young Earth creationists in Jewish circles, most of those people are heavily influenced by kind of reactionary Christian groups. And so without getting too much into the politics of Jewish life, um, when Jewish people were allowed to integrate with the rest of society, what we call the emancipation, uh, there was a big question about how to live a Jewish life in the modern world. And so one group said we should have fewer rituals, but keep our values. These were reform Jews. Another group said we should keep our rituals, but modify our values. And this was Orthodox Jews. And so some groups of Orthodox Jews began reading the Torah and everything a lot more literally than we had in the past. And this was influenced by the literal reading of a lot of Christian groups. Mm -hmm. And so that's where young earth creationism really exists in the Jewish world, but it's a minority because that's not how we're supposed to read the book. (laughs) Like even medieval commentators are like, no, don't read this literally. It's not a literal text. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, yeah, it's interesting, um, and it's kind of a tightrope walk uh, as a Jewish paleontologist to interface with those groups because it's kind of hard to tell them that, hey, you're being influenced by Christians because it sounds very callous. And mean. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so a lot of people from this religion are drawn to paleontology and science in general because it's just it, it's how we treat religion um, testing it and modifying it over time and it's connected to how we see the world and so there's been a lot of famous Jewish paleontologists one of the most famous would be Stephen Jay Gould who's one of my personal heroes but um, the first woman uh, president of SVP actually uh, Tilly Eidinger mm-hmm. was Jewish um, and the most recent president Jessica Theodore also Jewish mm-hmm. so <laughs> there's a lot of us um, I maintain we could have a minion, which is a prayer group at SVP. Mm. It has to have a minimum of 10 people, Um, (laughs) but that has not yet happened. (laughs) Well, it really throws a huge wrench into kind of this stereotypical idea in pop culture of science versus religion, for lack of a better word. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And, like, everyone asks, like, you can't question things in religion, and questions are so important in Judaism that we have them as a formal part of some of our ceremonies. Um, The Seder meal, which is the big thing on Passover, has this part called the four questions where kids are supposed to ask these different questions about why are we eating so weird tonight? And 
you know, that whole story about me questioning Jesus as the Messiah in Catholic school, if I had, you know, asked similar questions about something else in Hebrew school, the response from the teacher would have been eager discussion, mm. not shutting me down. <laughs> And yeah. that's just a lot more compatible with scientific thinking. Right. Yeah. Hmm. It also helps that Judaism doesn't proselytize. You'll notice nowhere in here did I say I you two should become Jewish because <laughs> that's <Right>. false. <laughs> um, like, we know, A, that people hate us and it kind of sucks to be Jewish, so we don't encourage people to do it. But also a fundamental part of Judaism is that you don't have to be Jewish to be a good person hmm. or live a good life. You just have to do good things. And so, why proselytize? <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. Um, I've certainly had experience dealing with proselytization in my time here. Um, and it, it's, it's always frustrating because, like, I, I won't name any names or relationships or anything, but, like, I've, I've talked to people, like, in confidence that, like, whenever I'm having particularly rough times, I'm, like, I'm looking for solace and, and sympathy and aid. Or even just companionship, and among some among some of these individuals, like there has been a tendency to let's use this to see if we can wedge you into our faith, right? Um, and it's like ah, that's not what I'm looking for. It's not this. <laughs> like I I live in a very Catholic area. I moved from Chicago to Southern New Mexico because there's a paleontologist here I wanted to work with. Um, <laughs> And I'm glad I did that. I don't like living in the desert. Mm. It's too hot. Um, but because I live near the border of Mexico, there's a lot of Catholics here and a lot of Christians in general. And we had to put up a sign on a door saying, hey, we're Jewish. Please stop giving us free Christian literature. It's a hate crime. Oh my so that's God. not our way. Because right. uh, like every... <laughs> Like, every Christian holiday, we would get another pamphlet about how we were going to hell for oh. not believing in Jesus. No, thank you. <laughs> Go away. Good grief. Yeah. So that sign worked, though. We haven't gotten one since. <laughs> oh, well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Right. Um, <laughs> it almost seems like sometimes, um, like, there's a, there's there are aspects of, of cultural Christianity that even weave their way into, like, mainstream paleontology. Yep. Talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, so we live in a Christian society. That is what it is. Um, at least if you live in the United States, Europe, or any country that, you know, got thoroughly colonized by Europe, um, like Christianity is a religion that seeks to spread itself because one of its founding theories is that it is the one true religion and it is universal. Um, which most religions don't actually have that. One of the few exceptions is Islam, but of course Islam and Christianity are the two most popular ones, so everyone thinks all religion does that. Mm -hmm. I digress. Mm -hmm. um, but so because of that, the society that we live in and societies uh, are based in Christian values because religion isn't actually separate a bowl from culture. Um, it influences culture heavily. For example, you know, everyone gets off for Christmas, mm -hmm. even if you don't want it. I <laughs> right. never, like, every year I have to be like, hey, Peter, I can work on December 25th. I got nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> so you can go do something and I can take care of this. Um, but, but in addition, you know, it's harder than for people who aren't in the dominant culture to get their things um, off. For example, every year it's a headache for me to take off for the high holidays. Mm -hmm. um, and last year at SVP, I had to give my talk on Saturday, right. which I was not thrilled about because uh, that counted as work mm -hmm. and that was to bot and I didn't want to do that. Um, but in addition, it just, the, these cultural things come up and how we talk about different stuff. And so one term that really struck me, because um, I may or may not have been listening to the Trey and Miles interview yesterday <laughs> in a futile attempt to study <laughs> for this, because that's who I am. And, <laughs> um, and I, they brought up Lazarus taxi. Right. And it's like, that that's just a Christian thing. 
<laughs> Lazarus is not a Jewish story. That is a right. very just a Christian story. Um, and so the idea of something coming back from the dead, even though it wasn't coming back from the dead, we just didn't know it was there. Uh, you know, that word itself is a sign of cultural Christianity. And it's just, it's a part of everything. Mm -hmm. And you really only realize it when you leave it. And so when I converted, it went from me being a part of the happy-go-lucky picture to suddenly being outside of it, and it's complete whiplash, and you start to see everywhere how Christianity has affected even things it shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then you tell your friends who didn't leave the rainbow, and then they go, oh my god. <laughs> right. Now you had mentioned at one point that you desired to be a rabbi. Um, yeah. So, what prompted that for you? Yeah, so... Science is hard. Um, <laughs> science is really hard when you have ADHD, um, and which I call the terminally bored disorder. Uh, you're always looking for something to get that dopamine hit because you have a chronic dopamine deficiency. Um, and I was kind of shoveled into molecular biology for my master's degree because my parents didn't think I could make a living as a paleontologist. And you know, they have a point. Um, it's not the most lucrative or uh, growing field. Um, but so I went into molecular bio, partly to appease them, partly because it was the only place that had funding for me, and partly because I wanted to see if I could make a chicken a Soros. <laughs> Spoiler alert, you can't. Um, <laughs> and the program was really hard, and I deeply hated it. And I was constantly bored. I, my wasps, I was studying wasps, kept dying. None of my experiments worked. And the, my committee essentially told me that I should probably quit with a master's. And this, man, this plus some other things managed to convince me that I wasn't cut out for science, which in retrospect was a very silly thing for me to conclude based off of very limited data. But here we were. But what I was good at was studying and understanding Jewish texts. I was really good at it. Um, I was constantly surprising rabbis and discussions, and multiple of them said, have you thought about becoming one? So for a very brief time, that's what I planned to do. And so I quit science. I started studying to be a rabbi, which included a lot of Hebrew, which is a hard language to learn. Mm. And I even taught Hebrew school for a little while, and it was extremely rewarding. But I very quickly realized how much I missed paleontology specifically. I was just sad that dinosaurs weren't as much a part of my life anymore, mm. but really sad. So this was during the pandemic. SVP um, had its first online conference in 2020, and so it was cheap, and I had the free time, so I decided to go. And I, it just reignited my love of paleontology. And I met, you know, the man who would become my future advisor, and I enjoyed talking to him. And so I talked to you two, actually, and quite a few other people, just asking, do you think I can make it as a paleontologist? And when not only you, Alb, and you, Joan, but Henry, Dr. Thomas Holtz, and Dr. Stephen Brousset all say yes, you kind of have to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, went into it, and it's so far going okay. Um, my head hurts all the time because I, of course, picked the most complicated thing I could pick because I'm not a clever man. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that's why, why the rabbi thing kind of died. It also kind of died because it's not like grad school where you get paid and, oh, my God. God, we were going to go broke if I went to rabbinical school. Mm -hmm. um, also, the only rabbinical schools are in L.A. and New York, and I didn't want to live in L.A. or New York. <laughs> right. <laughs> Fair enough. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of how that happened. But the dinosaur rabbi title stuck, and maybe someday I'll do it, because mm -hmm. why not? And it would be fun. But, you know, it's not what I'm doing now. Right. <laughs> Oh, sure. And I could easily see that for sure. I mean, it would, it, it would be kind of cool, the, the dinosaur rabbi. That's <laughs> a, 
I can't think I've heard of anybody like that that I that I've known. <laughs> right. Yeah. The the funniest thing is that I started teaching Hebrew school and the year before the Hebrew school that I was teaching at their annual like big sleepover thing was dinosaur themed. And I wasn't there. Oh no. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Like, oh come on. Can we do that again? And they're like, we can't do the same theme two years in a row. I'm oh. like, but now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> they could do they could have done a bird theme that yeah. definitely would have counted. Yeah, I should have suggested that. I don't know why I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, it happens. Um yeah. Well, I think this is a good segue now into our next viewer question. Um, now, uh, we do plan to ask you about like your journey in paleontology. So mm -hmm. I believe this particular question was gravitated towards that. Um, so like, you're welcome to answer this as much or as little as you like. Um, okay. This is from our friend Jasper. And they asked, mm -hmm. what was your favorite part of the journey to get where you are now? And what's something you would have done differently? Well, the big thing I would have done differently is not gone to Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad saying that because, you know, I married the person I met there. <laughs> um, but that would be the big thing is because I didn't really get the right start of education in terms of sciences. I didn't get to take any geology classes. Mm -hmm. My bio classes were not very relevant to paleo. Um, but the bit, my favorite thing that I've done is honestly i got to docent at the field museum mm. um during my masters and this is actually what led to the my committee telling me to leave because oh. my advisor went on one of my dino tours and saw how happy i was oh. and oh. how happy i wasn't at work <laughs> and he's just like you shouldn't be here i'm like well thanks that's <laughs> not anxiety inducing at all <laughs> so I got to give these wonderful tours about the evolution of dinosaurs. Um, and very quickly, I got to incorporate birds into that tour. And so it was just fun to watch people's eyes light up as they connected information. Mm -hmm. And it was just wonderful to hear questions and be able to answer them and to show people not only how birds are living dinosaurs, but how much that makes sense. Right. Um, and so I just realized while I was doing those tours that if I were to do paleontology, I'd want to stick to museums. And so that's kind of guided me during my PhD a little bit. Um, so that would be my favorite part, I think. <laughs> you know, I just realized this now, and I'll go ahead and I'll apologize in advance. Um, I, I realized that an anthropologist that I followed closely, um, he is the chair of notre dame's department of anthropology oh dear god <laughs> um and i believe i sent you his book like years ago yeah i think um, you did I, it's somewhere in the house we have like over two thousand books i don't know where it is <laughs> okay so like if you happen to have like cracked that open and noticed that i do apologize for oh, kind of okay. <laughs> like it, it's not like notre dame doesn't have good scientists i learned a lot while i was there it's just Ugh, they're so Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I guess, like, hearing that really surprised me because, like, hearing this particular anthropologist, like, speak about, like, matters of, like, religion and human culture, like, that's pretty much the exact opposite of what I've been hearing regarding, like, the, the creationist uh, aspects of things. So I'm just kind of like, oh, that's odd. <laughs> I, didn't, yeah. I didn't make that connection. Um, Notre Dame has a lot of different professors. Um, one of the classes my spouse took, not me, uh, the professor was Jewish. Um, and I don't know if our professor for our second, so basically everyone had to take two theology classes. Mm -hmm. And so my spouse and I took our second one together because he majored in political science, which could not have possibly had less overlap with biology. <laughs> so we wanted to take a class together, so we picked second theo. Um, and that was the history of the church. And so one of the most traumatic experiences of my college career uh, was the professor asked the class, were the bishops who didn't hide or help Jewish people during the Holocaust morally correct? Oh. Like, did they do the right thing by saving their own skins, essentially? And apart from me, Max, 
the professor and one other person who I knew from high school because my high school had a pipeline to, to Notre Dame. It's a whole thing. Um, uh, apart from the four of us, everyone said they did the right thing. Everyone. This was a dark day. I, I wasn't even Jewish yet, and I was sitting here like, this isn't right. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're supposed to help people in danger. What is wrong with all of you? So that was a thing. Uh, Dang. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Turns out when you put a bunch of rich Catholics, mostly white Catholics, in a room, bad things happen. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess um, regarding your journey into paleontology, um, we'll move to the next slide now. <laughs> um, since you had a shifted from wanting to become a rabbi to going back into the paleontology world, um, what was that path like for you? Well, um, I don't remember when I first got into dinosaurs because it was before I gained consciousness. <laughs> um, I, just, I, I just came into the world liking dinosaurs. My parents say that it was land before time. I believe them. They have no reason to lie about this. Um, but it's, it's, I have four significantly older siblings, and they watched a lot of stuff around me that they shouldn't have, but that <laughs> thing for me to talk about in therapy not an interview and among those things included jurassic park mm. and so between land before time and jurassic park i just got really into dinosaurs very quickly and i was born in the early 90s so there was a lot of dinosaur stuff happening at that time and one of the big things were the a and e dinosaur and then the pbs dinosaur documentaries that I yeah. definitely watched really early on. Mm -hmm. And that's what really sparked my love of the science. Um, and I just loved watching these scientists talk and showing what they were doing and demonstrating different things they were learning. And, you know, the more I read about everything that had been discovered, the more I was fascinated in the science of it all. And one of my dad's favorite stories that he still brags about to people even though I'm 31, um, <laughs> is that once I was in a grocery store with him and I was reading a dinosaur book, I must have been like four or something, and the cashier was like, what do you like most about dinosaurs? Expecting me to say, they're big or something, mm -hmm. you know? And I said, I like learning about how they evolve. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the cashier was just like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, some evolved from these little short things into big, big long necks. And some of them evolved into birds. And I just rambled for a long time. And so oh. that's my dad's go-to, look how smart my kid is. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so I just never really gave it up, even though my parents wanted me to, because they wanted me to have a secure career. Um, <laughs> And so living in Chicago, I was able to go to the Field Museum frequently. I remember when Sue was installed, for example. Um, and I remember the Evolving Planet exhibit before they renovated it mm. the first time, for that matter. Um, and I was able to connect to lots of things, and I had access to a great library. So even though I couldn't buy all the books as I wanted to, I was able to read all the books. And so it's just... Throughout my childhood, I was just obsessed with dinosaurs and prehistoric life, um, and it never really went away. And this always included birds, because I was lucky enough to have been exposed to the idea that birds are living dinosaurs very early on. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's implicit in Jurassic Park, but it's openly stated in A&E dinosaurs and PBS dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was familiar with the idea. I always connected the two in my brain. And so I also fell in love with birds pretty quickly. Um, and so for most of my childhood, I was just kind of balancing that love with trying to be a normal kid because most kids don't know this much about the ecology of, say, the Morrison for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my family helped as much as they could because they wanted me to go into science, but there was always that awkward aspect of it. And in high school, I kind of not pulled away, but I 
was really into fiction and writing more. So I never really got onto the paleo internet sphere until college, which I regret a little bit because a lot of people met each other and a lot of people got to do cool things because they met each other. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had been a part of that. Um, but then when I did join in college, I made a lot of great friends and it was great to finally have other people to talk to about this stuff yeah. instead of being the only expert in the room and having crickets respond to what I said. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, um, I, I really can thank the community of people who are interested in paleontology on a serious level mm -hmm. for the fact that I'm still here. Um, and so then, you know, trying to give it up, not give it up, but, you know, move into a completely different field. I just realized how much I need paleontology in my life. So now I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> and now what exactly did you do to get into becoming like an act, like a paleontologist? So I was lucky enough to have been able to do some paleontology work in undergrad. Um, because the only paleontologist of Notre Dame died right before I came there, there was a lot of mess to clean up. Mm -hmm. So I got the job of cleaning up the Burgess Shale collection that we had, which was very fascinating. And that really got me into thinking about these animals, not on their own, but as part of their ecosystems. Um, there's a tendency in paleontology to really focus on line of descent and phylogenetics and evolution, and that's very important, but that's only half of what an organism is. The other half is the place and time that it lives and the things that it lives with. Mm -hmm. And so I was fascinated with the ecology of the Burgess Shale. Um, whenever I thought about dinosaurs and dinosaur projects, I was always into their environments. Um, I'm a big fan of the game Thorian for this exact reason. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom Parker and I constantly talk about doing eco paleoecology stuff together, and then we don't, because <laughs> that's how these conversations go. Right. Um, uh, and so when I was at the 2020 SVP, I was talking to the man who had become my advisor, Peter Hood, about, you know, dino birds being the only dinosaurs to survive, and how, why those birds in particular, because if you're familiar, um, a lot of birds went extinct at the end Cretaceous extinction or birdie dinosaurs, I guess, mm -hmm. whatever you define birds as, we're not gonna do that today. <laughs> uh, 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 a lot of proto birds, I'll say that, yeah. uh, went extinct. Um, and the only ones that survived are modern birds. And so it was fascinating to me and I wanted to understand why um, that's not actually what I've ended up working on because it turns out a lot of people are interested in why and Peter doesn't want me to get scooped. Um, <laughs> but scooping for those who are unfamiliar is when you're working on a project and someone else is working on a project and they publish before you. <laughs> right. Mm. Essentially. Like it can be more complicated than that. There could be outright stealing, but the essential idea is you didn't publish quickly enough and now you can. Um, <laughs> So I was just really interested in looking at how AV faunas specifically have evolved. And so that kind of led me into studying the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, because before the thermal maximum, um, which was about 56 million years ago, most fossils are scarce, but so are bird ones. And while some clades differently appeared, not all of them did. And suddenly in the early Eocene, there's a bajillion birds everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's like, where the heck did these come from? <laughs> so is it because the world got warm or is this a coincidence? Right. So I'm trying to answer that question. Um, unfortunately, paleoecology is very holistic and uh, regular ecology is hard to account for all the variables. Yep. And then when you go back 56 million years, suddenly a lot of the variables are gone and you can't account for them anymore. <laughs> right. So uh, my project has been going slowly because I picked something too complicated and I think I can do it. But part of me is wondering if I shouldn't have just tried to do phylogeny of forest rockets instead. <laughs> 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 Which was my other idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, that's where I'm at is trying to log every single Paleocene and Eocene bird and crying because scientists prior to about 2000 are bad at keeping records. <laughs> Very bad at it. <laughs>
<laughs> like most of my work is me trying to find specimen numbers so that I don't log a bird twice oh, and not yep. being able to find them. <laughs> oh my gosh! Between that and Ade telling us about the um, the Peabody Museum and their their Trachodon labels, that's yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> like I. To anyone who wants to go into science, I'm warning you now, most science is cleaning up the messes of people who have come before you. <laughs> That's not wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's distressing. Also, like, history of paleoanthropology in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. Like, I'm glad that we all have more rigorous standards now, but sometimes I wish I could just say whatever the fuck I want and get away with it. <laughs> right. Like, we're able to do <laughs> like i recognize why that's bad and why we're i'm and i'm glad that we don't do that anymore but this isn't fair <laughs> right oh man so yeah that's kind of how i got here um and i'm hoping to keep doing paleoecology work provided it doesn't kill me mm -hmm. and uh hopefully one day either run or start my own museum Part of me wants to start my own so I can just start from scratch and make it what I want to be. Part right. of me wants to return a conquering hero to the Field Museum and <laughs> take it as my own. So, oh, cool. yeah. Mm. yeah. Like, mm. this has been my house since I was three, and it's mine again. Mm. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. And we've already been, you know, making great strides and contributing to the story of bird evolution. Um, in fact, on the next slide, we've highlighted two particular animals that you've worked on and, and helped describe. So um, yeah. you could tell us a little bit about your work behind the discovery and description of uh, Anacronornis and Daniel Savas. Yeah. Savas. So paleoornithology is a fun club that both Alb and I are in. Um, <laughs> and one of the more well-known amateurs of this club was a guy named Daniels and right. he right. died recently and this guy had collected a lot of fossil bird material and so now that he had you know passed Sikranola Vaca that's what Jewish people say when we talk about dead people um it means may their memory be a blessing um scientists in paleoornithology kind of all rushed it, a kind of gold rush honestly to describe yeah. all this material now that it wasn't in a private collection anymore and so Peter was friends, uh, my advisor Peter Hood is fr was friends with this guy. Um, and so he really wanted to describe some material uh, that was related to a fossil that Peter had found around when I was born, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and Peter wanted to, you know, describe this fossil earlier on because this fossil kind of showed the connection between chickens and ducks, which was a very controversial idea back in the early 90s because mm -hmm. genomic phylogenetics was not a thing yet. Um, and so, unfortunately, when he first tried to publish, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to gossip mm -hmm. on your in, your uh, mm -hmm. podcast, but um, the person who was in charge of the paper that he was submitting to essentially said no um, because it disproved his hypothesis that ducks were related to other things. Right. And so uh, soon after that, a paper came out showing the genetic connection between chickens and ducks. And so Peter thought that his fossil wasn't really pressing anymore. Um, but with the release of the material from uh, this private collection and then all of the new stuff that's been coming out about Vigavis, uh, this er early probable duck maybe not from the late cretaceous um he knew that he needed to get this bird out there and so uh this is when i started on the program and he knew that the big gap in my scientific career was that i didn't have any publications mm. because uh i was supposed to have one from my undergrad ecology research and that never went through and as i mentioned earlier my master's degree research was one thing failing after another so that obviously never led to a publication. Um, so he had me go on the phylogeny of for this bird and work on the phylogenetics. And I knew how to do phylogenetics to a point. I still asked famously 
Alb and our other friend John for help <laughs> doing the kind of nitty gritty computer programming part of it, because <laughs> Mr. Bayes is not an intuitive program. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was just in charge of doing all those phylogenetics and then making figures of the phylogenetic trees <laughs> and what these birds were related to. Um, and it was a crash course in doing science for publication very quickly. I learned a lot, and uh, I did my work efficiently enough that I also was given a few other things. Um, something that didn't make the publication was trying to figure out the size of these birds, oh. but every estimate we tried to calculate came out a different number, <laughs> so that did not make it in. Um, I also was in charge of the bibliography, which I have many critiques of bibliography software and i do not think they are as perfect as people claim they are. oh yeah agreed <laughs> <laughs> like no no uh zotero made my job harder at multiple points right. <laughs> so yeah um it's i just it's just funny for me because since uh peter found an acronornis in the early 90s i got to keep reminding him that this paper was taking as long as i've been alive which he asked me to stop reminding him. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, I love this bird very much. And Daniel Savas, though we know less about it. I mean, if you look at these pictures, uh, an Acronaurus has a skull. Yep. Daniel Savas does not. Um, but they are essentially a weird cross between a screamer and a magpie, goose, or duck, mm -hmm. which is... Not something you expect to see in the fossil record, because evolution isn't just, you know, you have a mixture and then one group goes one way and one group goes the other right. way. It's much more complicated than that, but that's what we had. <laughs> and so it came out as a stem to both birds, but man, if there's one thing that's going to let you realize how much phylogenies are just hypotheses, <laughs> it's doing phylogenies. Yes, uh, I can wholeheartedly co-sign that. <laughs> <laughs> like, and Acronornis kept coming out in all kinds of different places, and I'm right. just like, what the hell? <laughs> what are you? What is this? So, yeah, I take phylogenies with so many more grains of salt than I used to have. <laughs> Like, this sure is a hypothesis you have. Like, I was joking with my lab mate the other day, and we're like, the things we can be sure of, tetrapods are lobe-fin fish, birds are dinosaurs. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else is fair game. <laughs> Everything else is a mess. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah, it was a very great learning experience. But this bird is really cute um, <laughs> as well, which is always important. Um, but my funniest story, uh, if you look, its scientific name is Anacronornis animops, right. referencing the fact that it is related to screamers. Yeah, um, Hema. yeah, exactly. Uh, well, when I first, first, the name was going to be, the gen genus name was supposed to be Animops. And when I saw that, I had the reaction most millennials would have. Uh, <laughs> I read the word Animorphs uh, <laughs> because it is very similar and has similar letters. Right. And so I emailed my very much not a millennial, um, younger boomer uh, advisor. And I'm like, are you aware that uh, Animops looks very similar to Animorphs? And his response was, and I quote, and I thank God because we have a very informal relationship. Um, what the hell is an animal? <laughs> <laughs> and so then I just sent him the Google image. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's just like, ah, okay. And so that's how the name became an Acronautus Animops. Amazing. <laughs> And I'm just like, the Animorphs is still there, but I understand, and this is better than nothing. <laughs> I'm just, just going to quote, what the hell is an Animorph for the rest of my life? <laughs> it's, a, it's a great story. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, definitely major, major congratulations on the paper describing these, these two mm -hmm. birds, because uh, I, I know these specimens have been floating around uh, as well, rumors for a very long time. <laughs> and so it, it's fantastic to, to see them actually see, see the light of day. Um, and they are definitely 
very important for understanding yeah. how the early evolution of the chicken and duck like birds um i mean like as someone who tries to stay on top of like all the new dinosaur discoveries like i, I would go as far to say and I, I would say this even if you weren't here um <laughs> that the these are like some of the most scientifically important new dinosaurs to be named this year so far <laughs> and, and yeah the, <laughs> They're, they they are great. Um, they they are so new that we haven't talked about them on Dinosaurs the Second Chapter yet. But uh, we will in the next update special. We definitely will will have to cover them. Uh, it's great. I'm so honored to have been a part of this. To be honest, it is it it is a great great project to, to have worked on. So yeah, de definitely major congratulations. <laughs> and now the screamer relative that's in every freaking paper is named and no longer a screamer relative. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> like, about that. Um, <laughs> it's a relative of all Anceriforms, not right. screamers in particular. Yes. <laughs> well, someone finally had to test that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That, that's what science is. Yep. It's testing everything over and over again. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, well, I think this is a good time now. Um, we have some of our last viewer questions. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so we'll jump to the next slide. Um, so we have three separate questions from uh, our, our friend Alari, and my, my partner. Um, <laughs> and uh, now I know you had kind of alluded to this already. So I guess if you wanted to reiterate as much as you wanted to, go ahead. But um, so his first question was, what drove you to focus on paleogene birds instead of neogene birds? Mostly uh, serendipity. Um, I wanted to look at the end Cretaceous to extinction to paleogene transition. I got talked out of that, and the next closest thing was the PETM, mm -hmm. which is fascinating. And, you know, a lot of really interesting early forms of different modern clades show up in the earliest Eocene. Right. So I was always drawn to that. I also very much dislike the narrative of the age of mammals, if you will. <laughs> and so I'm constantly trying to disprove that idea. <laughs> um, and so this was an important step because people really haven't studied paleogene or neogene birds as much as you'd think. Yeah. Um, like, Gerald Meyer is probably a superhero um and he does most of the work right. and even he has to like do conjecture so essentially what led to me coming up with my thesis idea was um i was reading paleogene fossil birds uh for the second time because peter told me to and i was reading the ecology section and i was just kind of getting frustrated with how none of his claims had any evidence to back them up whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> he was just kind of spouting off stuff as, you know, I wish I was allowed to do. And so I was like, well, someone should probably do this. So I came up with a very thorough idea for looking into how birds might have adapted or reacted to the uh, Paleocene or Eocene thermal maximum and that's kind of how I got there. Um, but it's not anything really specific about paleogene birds, and my backup plan remains phylogeny of forest rackets, which uh, would include neogene birds, obviously. So, yeah. It is interesting to think about, like, contesting the age of mammals nomer that has just been around for so long. Because, like, even today, I'm pretty sure, like, species numbers and biomass birds have mammals eat so much like we aren't even sure how many uh different types of birds there are because we keep deciding things are new species and species are actually fake and birds love hybrid zones um yeah. so it's anywhere between ten thousand and twenty thousand <laughs> who knows <laughs> and uh Based on solely just how many, how much we realize that we were underestimated the diversity, I'm willing to bet it's closer to the 20,000 end. <laughs> um, and so, between that and the biomass thing, it's just it's so clearly a bias towards megafauna or ourselves that we say that this is the age of mammals, and like it is so clear from ecology that the top of the food chain is not actually the most important part of it. 
Um, and also there is no top. It's a web. <laughs> <laughs> and right. everything gets decomposed eventually. <laughs> so uh, between that and the fact that the only other land vertebrate group to even get anywhere close to birds is lizards, right. <laughs> which might surpass them. Um, it's just very frustrating to me that we call this the age of mammals. And it's frustrating to me that we call the Mesozoic the age of reptiles because there was probably a similar phenomenon, but we focus on megafauna. Mm -hmm. um, and really at the end of the day, everything's the age of bacteria. <laughs> right. So, I was just thinking that too. Yeah. Who said that though. <laughs> so I, you know, I, my parents were Catholic communists, um, still are. And so equality and justice was very important to me mm. from childhood and i've applied that to science <laughs> and i'm just like this isn't right we need to stop being so biased towards ourselves come on guys <laughs> oh yeah i mean think about how many histories of life that have been published or filmed or what have you always have to end with human beings and us taking over the world for real and like another thing that really struck me so there's this book Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, and I haven't read it since college, so I don't know if there's problematic stuff in it or not, actually, but um, I should reread it. Um, but there's a line in it, and the whole thesis of the book is just, you know, humans don't have a right to exploit the planet this much, actually, which, you know, I agree. Um, and the line was just, if you asked a jellyfish to say the story of the history of life, they would say, well, the first there was some primordial soup, and then things started to evolve to be multicellular, and eventually jellyfish appeared, and then they died. <laughs> and it's like, we think that we have this uh, objective perspective because we end recently, but that's only because humans evolved recently. Right. Right. We end with people because we're focusing on ourselves. And which is natural and makes sense. But since we know that, and since we're trying to understand nature from an objective perspective, we need to correct for that. And so I'm trying to correct for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. So moving on to our second question from Olari. Um, what, in your opinion, is the most underrated fossil Cenozoic bird and why? And what is the most overrated? Well, I can do overrated very quickly. It's Gastornis. <laughs> I love Gastornis. It's a wonderful bird, but it, everyone loves it because it's megafauna. True. And it, it's just a giant duck. It's not that special. <laughs> and a, a, a very impressive giant duck, but, it, you know, it's an herbivore. We thought it was a carnivore because... I guess we assumed big giant bird must be eating meat. I, I really don't know why we had that idea. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like this age of big birds, like walking with beasts tries to portray it as. Uh, mm -hmm. There really weren't a lot of big birds. It was just Gastornis. And while it's a great example for understanding how birds changed across the PETM, because it's present in the Paleocene and the Eocene, right. uh, beyond that, it's not actually that um important <laughs> and i feel bad saying that because everyone loves gastornis diatrima whatever you want to call it but it is it is the most overrated <laughs> um underrated uh, I, it's hard to pick because the problem is is that most people don't know any right right, right. <laughs> i'm just sitting here like how can i pick just one <laughs> um, i I guess I would have to say the zygodactylids mm. because, you know, we for the longest time we thought that passerines were more closely related to lots of other tree birds than to parrots. We did not group them with parrots. Parrots weren't even considered this outdated term called near passerines. Right. Uh, they weren't even there. And then we got this. We started doing genomic studies, and turns out they're sister clades. <laughs> <laughs> And sister to them is falcons, so they're not even anywhere near the near passerines at the slightest. <laughs> and uh, but it was always a question of like, what would that common ancestor between parrots and passerines even look like? Mm -hmm. And how did passerines get their foot shape if their closest relatives have a completely different foot shape? Right. Um, so I mean, everyone's listened to your podcasts here theoretically, so they know 
about the whole foot thing, but I'll review it real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, perching birds have anisodactyl feet, so they have three toes forward, one foot back, one toe back. And parrots have zygodactyl feet, so they have two forward, two back, as I can verify because I'm sitting next to one. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's very busy treating, if anyone was curious. Um, and so uh, zygodactylus and its relatives are little, very passerine-like birds with zygodactyl feet. And so it's rare that you find fossil evidence that helps to corroborate genetic evidence. Um, oftentimes they are very much at odds, see turtles. And so uh, it's just great when we have that evidence and it's helpful to complete the tree of life, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm gonna go with zygodactylids, but that it's a very hesitant assignment because <laughs> all birds are very much too underrated and at least some people know about zygodactyl. <laughs> 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 Oh, gosh. Well, it's like in a lot of the classic popular paleo books that I've read. Because I, I like vintage books, um, and I grew up with a lot of them. Oh, yeah. Like, the whole story of birds, like, in the majority of those is, like, we have Archaeopteryx, and then in the Cretaceous, there's Hesperornis and Ichthyornis, and then there's the KPG, and then you have Gastornis, and then you go all the way to the Ice Age to look at all the giant birds. And, what? like, almost everybody else is never mentioned. Right. Like, I think... Um, I have uh, Carol Fenton's The Fossil Book, and they outline, like, the different Cenozoic bird groups. Um, but, like, they, they talk about, you know, the moa and the dodo and all that stuff. And right. then they literally end with, and, of course, there are other, you know, like, flying birds that have been around. But those are so popular that we're not going to really get into them. <laughs> they just completely skip them all. Um, and here's the thing. Passerines being most birds is a recent development. Most of history, as far as we can tell, that's not what was happening. Mm, right. And it, it doesn't help that pastorines are very delicate and don't fast fossilize well. So take that with a grain of salt. It might just be preservation bias. Um, but our current avifauna that we have today is not what it was for most of his right. Cenozoic. And so there's a lot of evolution and change there that we need to understand better and not just go, okay, they were small and flying, it's the same. Because it wasn't the same. They were completely different birds doing the small flying thing. Yeah, right. Um, and, you know, it. there's just been a lot of great discoveries from these Lagerstadt, I don't know if I pronounced that right, I'm bad at pronouncing words, um, from different places in the early Eocene, including, like, the Messel Pit and London Clay and Fur Formation, and you usually only hear about like mammals in these things, right. like all these early mammals, but we have just as much of the backdrop of early birds. And skipping that is just a disservice to both avian evolution and evolution in general. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree for sure. And so now I guess moving us, and I guess that, that's actually a very good segue into this final question here um, from Alari. So if you could change anything in the history of paleoornithological research, what would you change and why? Oh God, um, <laughs> how are we defining paleoornithological <laughs> research? <laughs> what is a bird for the purpose of this discussion? <laughs> uh, I guess he didn't say. Um, <laughs> um, uh, let's say any any taxa that um, have classically been studied by ornithologists or people who would consider themselves in that field okay um then i'm gonna be really basic and say finding feathered dinosaurs before archaeopteryx because <laughs> uh, a aviale if it has any sort of distinct evolution towards birdiness um it's minor right. uh and um you know it's becoming increasingly clear that the ancestor of Paravians probably was flighted. Um, and like, it's much more complicated and mosaic journey than we knew. Yeah. And so saying that birds started at, at Avalé is just so clearly human bias to me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> this is the first one we found. So this is where they start. Right. And it's like, okay, but like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. So if I could change that, I would because yeah. I would love for birds to start literally anywhere else. I'll <laughs> take 
I, I can see arguments for Paravis. I can see them for Peneraptera. I can see them for Pygostylia <laughs> or Nithotheraces, yep. Ornithes, yep. so many places that aren't <laughs> Aviale. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> And, like, when I want to be a complete chaos gremlin, I go, technically, all of the metatarsalia are birds. <laughs> and then I watch people get mad at me. <laughs> oh, yeah, the famous uh, bird spectrum. Yeah. Always good. Well, they're all yeah. closer to birds than anything else. So. <laughs> yep. The biggest bird is Argentinosaurus. I will not be taking constructive criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure also, I'm sure you'd probably also add... Uh, Anything involving fiducia and the bandits. Oh, yeah. I, you know, look, skepticism is a good thing. It is important to question things. I'm questioning everything at all times. It's part of my charm. Um, and it was good to have people, you know, pointing out the weak spots in the idea that birds were dinosaurs back in the day. Mm -hmm. But as of 1996, which you'll note was a while ago now, <laughs> They no longer had a leg to stand on. <laughs> like, it wasn't just, like, any holes that were left in the birds or dinosaurs hypothesis were just, we don't have the right evidence, not we're doing something wrong. Right. Because there was nothing else birds could be at that point. Um, and for those unfamiliar, 1996 is when the first feathered non-avian dinosaur, I use that term loosely, uh, <laughs> was described. And so... Ever since then, they've just been delving more and more into pseudoscience because I can only assume human psychology is at fault here, yeah. that they don't want birds to be lumped in with dinosaurs because they think they'll get erased. And I understand that fear, but I don't think that's happening, so right. they can school it now. Um, like, people still love birds as their own thing, and them being dinosaurs is an added bonus, mm -hmm. not, like, a detractor. And so... Um, it's especially egregious when, you know, young earth creationists and other anti-Semitic pseudosciences are, you know, using Fiducia and his writings as proof for themselves. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> like, the minute that happened, Fiducia should have tucked his tail between his legs and stopped talking. <laughs> but he didn't. Um, and I really wish that no one would publish his books, but they do. I wish that museums wouldn't carry his books, but they do. It's, yeah, if I could go back and hit Dolo in the head with a rock, I would. <laughs> <laughs> right, birds are dinosaurs. You can re-evolve a structure. Also, those things that you're ignoring are furcula. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh gosh! <laughs> but you yeah, can't it, turn back time. <laughs> so similar frustrations with a lot of the uh, um, people in like historical fields, where like Graham Hancock, for example, with the uh, the, um, the the Pleistocene civilizations, and then oh, the, the the Ice Age um, ancient aliens, and all that kind of uh -huh. stuff, the, and like like the. the they are well within their rights to publish all this stuff. That doesn't mean that they should, um, because that's just that's just making more work for everybody else. Right. Um, oh my God, that that Graham Hancock show. It's like one of the most popular shows on Netflix. Like, it, oh, and no. that's gonna it's, it's reaching too many people. <laughs> oh um, God. Because like all the anthropology people that I've followed have had to make responses to this. <laughs> And it's it's a big waste of time for them because right. they're sitting there releasing two to three hour videos and forcing themselves to watch this multi episode series, mind you, and just hitting the same points that have been hit for decades with with these people that have been that have been putting all this all of this stuff out there. This and it's yeah, that, that's certainly something that I would I would go back mm. and and and, and <laughs> um, yeah, I. We, we've kind of created this society where truth is what you want it to be, and I find that extremely distressing because yeah. reality isn't going to go away just because you wish it would. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I've tried. Um, <laughs> and, like, you know, between fake news and climate change denials and all of the misinformation about COVID-19, it's just become so clear how much people who do this kind of thing, like make things about ancient aliens or 
say birds aren't dinosaurs when we literally have one of the most complete evolutionary transitions ever. Right. Um, uh, like, why not focus on bats? I'm sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, like, we don't know where bats came from. Think about them. Uh, uh, but uh, it's clear how much they're playing with fire and how bad it is that they're doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, like, I believe in free speech and everything. I do. But there needs to be something we to stop this because it's just not good. It, yeah. it creates the impression that and science is a lot more subjective than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And we need to destroy that impression. Like, the reason so many people are like, oh, yeah young earth creationists can keep doing their thing is because they don't know exactly how far removed from reality they are. <laughs> and that applies to all of these examples that I've brought up. So, yeah. yeah. It feels scary. like there's this, and I mentioned this, this is one of those like great stereotypes in, in science, that a, a scientist is somebody who sits in their armchair at home smoking a cigar <laughs> and being like, and, and just theorizing in their head and then publishing that as a book. Because yeah, no. <laughs> like I've literally like, talked to people who ha who have tried to put their foot in the door with like this ancient aliens, like ancient civilization stuff. <laughs> and they're like, well, who's to say that it couldn't be true? Well, <laughs> like, that's well, why we have the principle of parsimony. <laughs> 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 Yeah, right. there's lots of stuff you can't prove or disprove, but that's why science has this whole thing about we go with what the majority of evidence indicates <laughs> and the simplest explanation for that majority of evidence. Right. Which I think a lot of science education fails because they don't get across that those are the two most important parts of science. <laughs> right. And you have people cherry picking a single paper and saying vaccines cause autism. <laughs> right. It's like with that. <laughs> that sketch where the person is like you know, vaccines cause autism it's like well i have 99 papers that say that it doesn't and then one right. that it does oh perfect <laughs> yeah just... like no you can't just pick one thing that you like and go with it and this is not to bring it full circle or anything but this is why i call judaism the most scientific religion because there's the whole text body is people arguing about things and there are often alternate hypotheses for what a particular mitzvah should or should not be mm -hmm. but usually jewish groups go with the ones that have most people backing them up because obviously there's a reason most people back them up <laughs> the majority of evidence suggests that this is the right answer and so that's what we do in science except a lot of people miss that memo so yeah <laughs> right or they think that like one discovery is going to fundamentally change the entirety of a field's theory yeah, no. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I've been guilty of this. I was too excited about Ornithocelida when it was published. I should not have been. I have learned from this mistake. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's kind of in limbo now, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. essentially. <laughs> that topology what? can go any one way, and, like, it's, it's just a question of which one. You know? Yeah. Like, there just needs to be more people working on it. Like, the reason we need as many different types of people in science as possible is because we all bring in our own biases. Mm -hmm. And so there's always going to be flaws in any study, which is why it's a numbers game. So right. you need as many people doing these things as possible. And then the average is probably going to be true. <laughs> right. And certainly anthropology has been, that, that's been a problem for many years that I've noticed is um, pe people study you know, most of the people of like Euro-American descent go and study these, these societies and mm -hmm. they, they're carrying their biases with them. And so now we're seeing this huge resurgence where the people from those societies are actually contributing to like whatever research is, is going on. And yeah. it, it's just so much richer and, and, and first off, more accurate. Certainly. Right. <laughs> and uh, we definitely need more of that everywhere. Yeah. Like... I, I hate when people say that science is, you know, a, a white supremacist thing, because like while a lot of modern scientific ideas do trace back to the European Enlightenment and everything, all cultures have done science mm. throughout history. Right. It's mm -hmm. just how you test ideas about the world. And now that the world is a little bit more fair than it used to be, 
insert asterisks here, <laughs> more people from different places are able to do science. And yeah. so it's not just a Europeans defining the world project anymore, and it shouldn't be, and it shouldn't have been in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, I guess, speaking of scientific research, um, if we jump to the next slide, uh, we're pretty much towards the end of our interview here. Um, right. I guess just to kind of wrap things up with some basic questions. Um, so what research and projects are you working on now? And, and what could we expect to see in the near future? So I'm currently looking at how ranges of birds were affected by the PETM. Mm -hmm. uh, most research about living birds and how they respond to rapid climate change indicates range changes are their biggest adaptation, yep. which makes sense. Most birds can fly, and so they have a better ability to change where they live than not flying animals. <laughs> right. um, and so uh, I'm gonna, I'm trying to see if I can gather enough data to see if there's a range change. That's the big thing I'm doing. Um, I'm limited very much by the poor preservation record of the Paleocene epoch, yeah. but I'm trying. Um, beyond that, I'm looking into just general ecological changes, uh, diversification rates, uh, the new evolution of new clades, and it's taking me a while because of the poor record keeping of the past, but I'm <laughs> chugging along and... Hopefully, we'll have enough that my presentation at SVP this year isn't depressing. Um, uh, You're every so that's you say, no, I appreciate that. Um, I have two months. I have two months, and it's a presentation, so I can do stuff literally the night before I have two months. Um, uh, beyond that, um, mostly I'm just trying to, you know, keep some SciComm stuff going on ADAD because uh, people enjoy it. Um, my current silly brain crack is this video game idea that I'll never do. Um, <laughs> it's like Stardew, except you're not a farmer, you're a naturalist. Mm. And it's basically the world is on fire, so you and your friends decided to start a commune in the Yishion Formation. <laughs> and your job is to catalog all the different stuff in the Yishion Formation. Um <laughs> And the working title, I'm very proud of this, is I, comma, naturalist. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if anything will ever come of that. I'm honestly saying this, so if someone wants to steal the idea and do it, they do, because I just want it to exist. Right. Oh, yeah. um, it's a fun idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm Because I'm me, I'm also making it Jewish, because, like, mm. I don't know how much you guys play stardew like games but their calendars are always very christian uh, there's always a halloween there's always a christmas there's always something easter like mm. and it's like why <laughs> why <laughs> like even there's this new one coral island that is mostly inspired by indonesian and chinese cultures hmm. And it still has Christmas and Halloween. <laughs> oh, gosh. Don't understand. <laughs> well, there's that cultural Christianity sleep sweeping in again. Yeah. For real. So one thing that's in my version of this idea is that the calendar is based on the Jewish one, because I can. Uh, yeah. So those would be my favorite right now. <laughs> yeah. So I guess on that note, um, so let's say that anyone watching who maybe is not well-versed in the world of paleontology, if they want to dip their toes into that world, um, what are some resources that they could look at or, or things that they could do to get started? Well, there are a lot of great intro books out there now. Um, one written by our friend uh, Evan Johnson Ransom mm. is really great. Uh, I think it's called Dinosaur World. Um, right. uh, there's always, you know, Darren Nash's works, uh, including the... Um, dinosaur encyclopedia book that he did as well as uh the recent one that he wrote with barrett i forget the title um and then there's also uh you know a lot of online resources not just my blog but weirdly wikipedia i don't understand how wikipedia's paleo sections managed to be decent compared to rest of wikipedia <laughs> but it remains decent so <laughs> Like, I unironically recommend it, <laughs> and I recognize how that sounds, but it's true. Um, and just listening to things like this, Eons is really good. 
Uh, but, you know, anything where they're talking about paleontology in a way that's accessible and not too jargon filled, because as much as I love everyone in this field, and I do, uh, we all use jargon too much and we need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, I will never forget one time our friend uh, Jack, who's a paleo artist, called his hand a manis. <laughs> I started hitting my head on the desk. I'm like, there's a word for that. It's called your hand. <laughs> what is this? Precipitation. Oh, it means rain. Why don't you just call it rain? <laughs> right. Like, it's one thing to use jar jargon. is important because you need to be exact about what you say, especially in scientific literature. Mm. But it doesn't help in SciComm, and you have to simplify it as much as possible mm. in SciComm. You just do. Because the more unfamiliar words you throw in there the more you're gonna lose people right. that's just what it is <laughs> yeah and i know like on this show at least like we've tried to avoid like throwing out jargon like just right off the bat um right like we're always careful to like explain what it means and, and give familiar examples because um i think it's certainly i mean it's, it's always good to learn about these terms and that way like as people who are interested in these fields want to read more widely about it and then kind of, you know, move more into more like complex, like technical literature. Like they at least right. have a, a frame of reference for when they come across these terms again. Right. One, one project that kind of died was a paleo dictionary. I still think we should probably make that because hmm. hmm. there's just so many of these terms that, you know, even I needed help figuring them out back when I was kind of starting doing this more formally. Yeah. Um, and it would just help a lot of people understand it a little bit better and not be so overwhelmed by scientific literature, especially. Yeah. And there's a lot of terms that, like, are, like, synonymous, too. Like, I, right. I'm i surprised I didn't realize this. Like, when I, when I was researching the um, that Neolithic ancient DNA study for our last episode, I didn't realize that patrilocal and virilocal mean the same thing. Oh, my God. And I was like, oh, that, that's good to know. <laughs> I mean, even with, like, like living things, you know, you have five different terms that technically mean warm-blooded. Yeah. But if you say warm-blooded, people know what you mean. <laughs> right. Or it's, like, common names with animals. Um, right. I know some are certainly more extensive than others. Uh, right. My favorite example is, is, of course, the Puma, Puma Conqueror. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There's, like, 50 <laughs> different names for that animal because they live all throughout the Americas. Right. <laughs> or did. <laughs> At one point. <laughs> My oh. favorite is always going to be how the turkey is named for every other country in every language. <laughs> and oh, really? blaming other countries for the presence of the turkey. <laughs> it's kind of funny that, like, in Spanish, um, turkey is pavo. Right. Right. Which is what we use as the genus name for the peacock. Right. Correct. <laughs> So I'm curious about what that what's behind that story. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. Do you, Elb? Not off the top of my head either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's obviously, something to be researched yep. for later. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and I guess one more question, and um, I admit this. Maybe, maybe this is a bit loaded. Um, oh, but, no. but you've given us a lot of information and stories about your Jewish education. Um, yeah. So kind of like in parallel with the paleo question. Um. If anybody is interested in wanting to experience that journey and, and look deeper into the, the, the Jewish faith and people, um, what could they do? What resources could they look well, at? Well, first, um, I wouldn't ever call it a faith. Um, belief oh. is really not a part of Judaism. Um, there's a funny joke among many Jewish people online that's where Jewish people are required to believe in no more than one God. <laughs> um, <laughs> there might not be a God, but if there is one, there's just the one. <laughs> um, uh, like agnosticism is very, very popular in Judaism. Um, there are quite a few funny stories, including one where two rabbis were arguing over whether or not God was real. And they concluded at the end God wasn't real. And then one of them started going to shul or synagogue. And the other one was like, why are you going to synagogue? We just realized God isn't real. And he's just like, like that matters. <laughs> <I'm still going laughs> to synagogue. Um, so uh, it's really not a faith. It's, uh, it's more focused on what you do and how you act mm -hmm. and how you live in the here and now. We famously don't have an official afterlife. Some of us think 
that we'll all physically rise from the dead when the Messiah comes. Some of us think we'll, we get reincarnated. Some of us think that all that's at the end is nothingness. It's fun. Um, but it's more intellectually honest, which is one of the many reasons it speaks to me. Right. Because, you know, when I was Catholic, I couldn't believe in heaven or hell, and I thought that that itself was going to send me to hell. <laughs> uh, and now it's like, I don't know what's in the afterlife, and I don't have to know. <laughs> nice. Right. Uh, um, but so it's a lot about ritual, and it's a community. It, the purpose of Judaism is to keep the Jewish people going. Um, and so... You know, it's not like people aren't allowed to convert. Obviously, I did. Um, but it's a lot more... Ellie, why are you screaming? <laughs> uh, it's a lot more you're joining a people or becoming a citizen of a nation mm. than it is you're adopting a new belief system. Right. And so uh, that's a very serious thing, especially when our numbers, as far as I'm aware, still haven't recovered from the Holocaust. So... Um, but the big places to learn are definitely sites like My Jewish Learning, um, which are holistic and not specific to a particular style of Judaism. Um, similarly, there's the book Essential Judaism, which covers like everything. Um, it's a very thick book, but I read the whole thing and I love it. Um, I all automatically re recommend it to anyone who's interested because it covers everything and shows the whole history in a unbiased perspective. Um, there are lots of other resources, but they tend to be denomination specific. So like reform minded or orthodox minded or uh, conservative, which doesn't mean what you think it means minded. <laughs> um, ironically, I'm a very staunch leftist, but I think my Judaism most closely follows conservative Judaism. Because <laughs> the, the thesis for conservative Judaism is we have to balance tradition with modernity as carefully as possible. So it's like trying to pick the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one that speaks to me the most. Um, my spouse is very reform. Uh, <laughs> and it's a funny joke between us. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so if you're interested in like converting through a specific movement, those resources are helpful. But for general education, things like my Jewish learning and, um, essential Judaism are going to be the best and least biased sources out there. Got it. Wow. Well, yeah. Meg, thank you. Thank you yeah. very much for coming on our show and talking with us today. It was um, fun. <laughs> I think this was a, a very great interview and it, it's always good to hear from you. I mean, we, we've all been friends with each other for many years now mm -hmm. and, uh, it's always good to kind of keep in touch and, and, and share our stories with the world, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are great friends. I love being friends with you. <laughs> um, and this is a wonderful podcast. I'm proud of you guys for doing it. Well, thank you. That means a lot. Yay. <laughs> and so, of course, on this slide, we have where um, our viewers can find you if they want to follow your adventures. Great. Um, and of course, with that, that is the end of our series. We'll move to the next slide for our general acknowledgments. So of course, um, the music for our series was um, created by our good friend, Henry Thomas, who, um, which opens up every episode that we've done. And of course, the color scheme for Albert's Alversor Avatar is by our good friend, Alicia Hutchinson. Um, and of course, Meg will definitely give you a special thanks again for taking the time to yeah. come on and, and join us. It was um, great. I'm glad I did this. Yeah, and like I think the timing worked out super well in the end, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah, we've been meaning to do this for a while, and I keep not having time because I overbook myself. Yay! <laughs> well, we, we're okay. all busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, of course, um, if you are interested in following through Time and Clades, uh, we do have a Twitter that is Time and Clades, um, or at Time and Clades, I should say. Um, but most likely you were watching us on our YouTube page through Time and Clay. So if you want to give us a like and a subscription, that's always appreciated. Um, we are on Patreon. Uh, we accept any and all monetary donations. If you want to uh, contribute to the series to help us create new projects and expansions and interviews. Um, we're currently at five patrons right now. And they are all at a tier where they are owed shout outs. Um, so my sister Julia is back. And we also want to thank uh, our friends Paul, Denver, Frankish, and 
Val de Nunzio. Um, so thank you all very much for your contributions. It means a lot. Um, of course, if you are interested in learning more about our guest today or anything that we've talked about, um, we have links in the description. Um, if you have questions that you want to ask us about any of the topics um, on, this, on this interview or just anything in general, um, we have three main means of communication. You can send us an email, timeandclades at gmail.com. Um, you can send us a comment on our YouTube section or you can tweet at us and we will almost certainly get to it as soon as we can. Um, but with that, that is the end of our show. We want to thank you all so much again for joining us. Um, in terms of what is coming next, of course, we have our regular news episodes that we produce monthly when we can. Um, we understand this has been probably a, a packed month for through time and clades. I mean, mm -hmm. we have had two interviews and uh, um, a news episode. Um, and of course, we have more on the way. Uh, we are approaching our three year anniversary. So definitely uh, stay tuned for updates on that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> but otherwise, um, we hope you all have a very wonderful day, and thank you all again for joining us. Take care, everybody. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs>